Hello, I'm Christina Zachary and welcome to the Home Sweet Home podcast, San Antonio Live. So we are located in San Antonio and we are live right now coming at you. Of course, on the YouTube world, we're not live, but it doesn't matter. Thank you for watching our podcast and attending again. We have another wonderful guest. We are joined by Luis Rodriguez. Um, he's with Presidio Advisory Group. So he's a tax expert. And of course, it's the peak of tax season. Or we just passed the peak, but we just always want to keep you guys updated on what's going on in San Antonio, all the cool people here. And we are super excited to have Luis today. So hi, Luis. Hi. How you doing? Hi, Christina. How are Thank you? Thank you so much for being here. I know you have a lot going on in your life. So we are blessed and honored to have you here today during your busy, busy schedule. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> so can you talk to the YouTube world a little bit? Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. Um, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I am a tax expert. My, my professional license is called an enrolled agent. Uh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now um, and uh, love it. Uh, it's a crazy world, but you know, love what I do. So. <laughs> no, we could definitely tell. So, uh, Gabriel and I've been using you for, I think about three years now. Mm -hmm. And I, I can make a true Testament. Uh, we tried, I think two or three, um, accountants before you did not have good experiences and it was a very frustrating. And when we finally found you, we're like, Oh, <laughs> so, so happy and excited. Thank you. So, okay. Let's kind of start from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, did you grow up, were you born here in San Antonio? Did you grow up here? And, or if not, what led you here to San Antonio? Um, Texas, born and raised, um, but not San Antonio, born and raised. I'm originally from a town southeast of here called Goliad. Um, oh. I, you know, Texas history is very important. <laughs> um, but, you know, originally born and raised there. Um, and... Uh, I left when I was 18, uh, went to college my first year in uh, Kingsville, uh, mm. and I started going for engineering, civil engineering, actually, um, and decided that, you know, I wanted to make a move to San Antonio because I had some friends of mine that were moving over here and decided I wanted to follow them over. And uh, when I made the switch, my grades weren't the best at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, basically my first semester here in, at UTSA, uh, I, I, um, you know, was on school, pro uh, what they call school probation, uh, at the time just to kind of get my grades back up because otherwise they were going to kick me out. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the good part about it is I was able to overcome that and spent the rest of my, uh, you know, three plus years here and to graduate from, from UTSA mm. and uh, proud alumni. Uh, now we got a good football team and, mm. and love it. And, and, you know, it's, it's been an interesting pathway. Um, you know, after graduation, move, uh, I moved up to Austin, lived there for a couple of years. I was in the mortgage industry for, wow. I did mortgage, uh, refinancings and stuff like that for a couple of years. I loved it. Love numbers, love finance. Um, actually have my degree in, um, uh, general business and, uh, with a double minor in economics and finance. Okay. I don't even have an accounting degree, which is really funny. <laughs> a lot of people laugh about that because they're like, you, but you know what, what so much is numbers are numbers. I mean, you mm, know, everyone's numbers are different, but we all love what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, so long story short, um, moved here to San, uh, moved back from, uh, from Austin, uh, to, uh, met my wife. Uh, we got married, um, moved from my hometown, I uh, moved down to my hometown to live there for a couple of years. And then after that, um, uh, we moved back to San Antonio to be closer to her family, um, give us more of an opportunity um, for fi financial growth, mm. um, and also to be closer to whole her folks after we had our had, had our little one. So, um, you know, it's just it was one of those things to where we got closer to home. And, and this is, to me, San Antonio is home. I mean, I... I, I, I I love my hometown, mm -hmm. um, but I can definitely say I've been here, God, uh, I'd say it's almost 20 years mm -hmm. uh, between college and, and after college. So, I mean, I could say it's pretty close that this, would, this is a hometown. So Nice. And what do you love about San Antonio? What do you guys do here? Um, well, with my schedule, with my business, I don't <laughs> do a whole lot. But, um, you know, growing up with my little one, uh, going down to the zoo was one of the one of the most fun things that we could do, mm. uh, except when it got, you know, a hundred 
plus yeah. degrees <laughs> on that asphalt. It gets get a little warm. It definitely gets a little warm. But even, even the animals don't enjoy it. This okay. is true. This is very true. <laughs> they don't like it either. Um, San Antonio was a lot of uh, you know has a lot of great places. We're I think if I'm not mistaken, we're becoming more of a foodie town uh, here. Yes, um, yes, yes, we, yes. We we definitely love our culinary uh, arts stuff here. Um, I've got a really good friend of mine, client of mine, who owns a couple of restaurants here in town. Uh, is actually going to be down doing the what is it called the um, this weekend they've got that thing down at Smoke Barbecue um, some sort of uh, te- Elder Eats uh, Texas oh okay feast. yes um, yes yeah so he'll be down there and so Very long cool. story short it's just uh, there's a lot of things you know I, I like to eat you know my mother in law makes really good food um, but you know you know there there's a lot of artsy craftsy things uh just a couple of weeks ago my my daughter's into anime and stuff and so she we went down to do the uh what is it called the um uh, they had some deal not this past weekend or the weekend before um it was the where you go down there and go check out the anime stuff and mm. it was hot it was super hot that but it was warm <laughs> worth it but it was worth it uh. Be, I spent, definitely get some good time with my my uh, my wife my daughter so um Anyway, but that I mean, there's a, there's a lot of little things, but with my you know, it was the Comic Con actually. Thank you, um, <laughs> the, and so uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of little things that are out there that um, that you can do. San Antonio has a you know sports great sports scene. Mm-hmm. We just finished up the, with the Spurs with the, the the now the rookie officially the rookie of the year, uh, Victor Wimbanyama. I mean the, the great basketball player. I think he's going to be phenomenal for many years to come. Uh, there's a rumor coming around that that supposedly we're going to uh, get a baseball stadium downtown as well mm. so i mean from an economic standpoint i think we're moving up in the world there's also rumors the spurs are moving from the at t center <laughs> that is what i hear um but if they do move them from there more than likely it'll be downtown at mm-hmm. that at that location uh hopefully they do get that and you know my personal opinion is that it I, I think that they need to do something like that because it would bring more of a downtown feel, downtown vibe uh, to that downtown area, and it needs to definitely bring bring it up in that way. So, I know we're always thinking about revamping. Just revamp, For sure. revamp, revamp. I mean, and and it comes with the territory. I mean, with you guys being in real estate, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I think uh, everyone always look, needs to take a look. Have, always have a fresh coat of paint mm. uh, of looking at something new. Absolutely. I mean, because you can always um, you can always stick a uh, what's the what's the term? You can always stick a, a lipstick on a on a pig, but it's still a pig. You know, in yeah, some aspects, yes. and vice versa, the other way around. Um, you know, you can always have a diamond in the rough as well. So a exactly. lot of people need to look at both in, uh, go, both ends of the spectrum. So yeah, so you were in mortgage lending. Mm-hmm. How do you end up as an accountant? It's like what? How, Where's that shift, and how does that shift happen? Well, um, that shift happened for me um, when I it was the tail end of the 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 late, I would say the early two thousand refi boom, um, mm. and a lot of uh, professionals such as myself at the time um, were selling mortgages to people that really didn't need them, mm. and um, you know, th- you know what they call you know what happened in two thousand eight with the yep. bubble bursting. Yep. Uh, so a lot of subprime mortgages out yes. there. Mm-hmm. I was part of that 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 group that was selling those subprime mortgages. Mm. Um, I got out, and the reason why I got out is because I felt sticky, icky. Mm. I didn't, didn't feel, feel good about it. I didn't feel good about it. So my last one before I quit was I sold a mortgage to a lady um, that was retired. She was in her sixties, mm-hmm. you know, getting Social Security and a pension. She wasn't making a whole lot of money. Um, and, um, you know, basically sold her a $60,000 mortgage Mm -hmm. and, uh, when she didn't need it, her house was paid free and clear. And Mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, my boss, uh, you know, I, I was right before the end of actually going to sell it to her officially and finish the paperwork. And I said, you know what? I really feel like this isn't the best situation for you. Mm -hmm. I had a, I had a clause, uh, uh, you know, a, a, I had an ethical dilemma at that point. Mm. And, you know, I I hung up the phone and basically um, cut the call. And my boss, you know, got mad at me. He was listening on the call and he brought me into his office, you know, yelled at me, did a lot of cursing at me. Mm. And I basically told him, you know, 
F you and I'm gone. Um, yeah. you know, and I hate to say it that way, but you know, it's just your ethics gets to a point where you just don't feel like you need to do something like that. And that was what turned it for me. And I tried to go and do it some more. Um, and did it for another, maybe another year. I went uh, work contract. Uh, and at that point and was doing uh, contract labor work, you know, but I re- really wasn't selling a whole lot because I didn't have enough lead generation. Yeah. And um, so long story short, after that last year was over, I mean, I, I, I ended up uh, moving back home. And when I moved back home, uh, there was a lady uh, when I was looking for work, mm-hmm. there was a lady, the, the local CPA there in town uh, that wanted to that was looking for for help. And so uh, she knew me. I didn't know her. Um, she knew me through my family and stuff like that. And mm. she said, you know, I'm going to give you a shot. I said, okay. And <laughs> basically uh, after about, it was probably about, about four weeks, five weeks, she called me in my office, into her office and closed the door. I was like, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. I'm going to get fired again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she actually, she praised me. She said, you know, you've got a knack for this. You've got a good brain. We don't get that kind of talent around here that often. And uh, she said, you know, would you consider actually um, going back and getting the rest of your hours for your accounting degree? Mm. And so she said, I'll pay for it. Wow. And so, you know, the next the next two and a half years, um, I went back and w- was working full time, going to school full time um, and getting the remainder of my hours to sit for my CPA exam. And um, I... I, I got through there, got, ended up, you know, meeting my wife. We had a, we had a baby. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, you know, we, we really decided, you know, to really consider making a move because I really wasn't moving forward financially mm. uh, as fast as I'd want to. Uh, yeah. when, I, when I left my, my, my job and moved to San Antonio, I was making $13 an hour. Okay. Five years in as a professional. Yeah. As a licensed, as a professional, five years in, making mm-hmm. thir- a degreed accountant, making 13 bucks an hour. I'm like, mm. come on. There's got to be a little bit more. But again, it was the location of where I was, small mm-hmm. town, not making a lot of money. Right. So moved to San Antonio and uh, worked for three other firms locally here in town. Went to go take my exams. I failed them, unfortunately. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's disappointing. It happens. It does. It does. But um, that also motivated me to see is there other things that i can do with um with as a degree accountant to become professional licensed and i found this enrolled agents license uh and it you know what a lot of people are confused and i'll and i'm sure you're probably going to ask but you know a lot of people get confused what's the difference between a cpa and an enrolled agent uh just hit the mic i'm sorry no, you're fine. um and basically the difference is um in it from a taxation perspective exactly the same Okay. Nothing different. I'm federally licensed, mm-hmm. federally licensed by the IRS to uh, to prepare tax returns and also to be a your liaison between you and the IRS. That's mm-hmm. my job. Um, and a and a CPA is state licensed to um, and to basically do what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are federally licensed. And mm. so I can take my deg- my my um, my place uh, as far as my uh, licensure across the country to do tax returns. Nice. Unfortunately, um, a a, deg- uh, a CPA cannot. Okay. So um, I don't prepare financial statements. Um, I don't do those. T- I, I I don't uh, review audit financial statements. I choose that's those are called asset attestation as attestation attestation engagement <laughs> excuse me um i don't do those mm-hmm. um and there's a reason why i don't i did it as a as an employee for 10 years for other accountants mm-hmm. but i there's a lot of work and a lot of red tape that goes through it and and, and that is the major difference from from an accountant versus the cpa that i don't didn't want to do so i knew i didn't want to go that route so i didn't have to Nice. So, um, I do a lot of bookkeeping. I do a lot of payroll. I do, you know, our office does a lot of that stuff. Uh, I do do a lot of IRS audit work, a lot mm-hmm. of IRS audit work, um, and, um, you know, a ton of tax work. Um, and, you know, at the end we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of work with, with regards to the, um, um, 
you know, a lot of tax planning, you know, and that's kind of another thing that, that I'll, I'm we're going to wanted to get in topic on is what makes a, an accountant such as myself versus someone who does, mm-hmm. um, like, uh, you know, turbo tax or something like that. Um, <clears throat> The biggest thing is that I would say is why would someone need me to help them with their taxes? Mm -hmm. Um, And one of those things is if you've got a side gig economy, um, you know, that gig economy is is growing leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, you know, working a a W-2 job, but then, you know, then a lot of folks are also doing side gig work. You know, I'm going to do a side hustle. I'm going to go do Uber ride sharing or I'm going to go maybe start out initially as a real estate agent. Yeah. I do have seen a lot of that over my career. And what ends up happening is those side gigs start making some good money. I've had a lot of teachers that have, have basically turned the corner mm-hmm. from being uh, a full-time teacher to quitting their teacher jobs and going full-time real estate. Mm-hmm. So those gig economies, they, they kick up. And those are the my, my prime bread and butter. I do... Probably out of, um, we handle, our firm handles about 2,500 projects a year. Um, and of those 2,500 projects, I'd say probably a good thousand of them are business tax returns. Mm-hmm. Um, and so of those thousand business tax returns, you got an individual that owns that business at yes. some point. So, um, you know, maybe it's one individual, maybe it's multiple individuals. But at the end, we do handle a lot of side gig. We also handle you know, basically a lot of work in that sense. So nice. I was going to actually say, I know that being in the business for, for 20 years, you've seen a lot, you've experienced a lot. So I think just, it comes natural with the territory of, um, the, the whole solution oriented. Do you still find yourself coming into new things that you haven't seen before? Um, especially with the whole, uh, like we said, the gig economy or just, the business side of things is always transforming. Are you still learning new things or do you still finding things keep repeating itself? I'd say, you know, at, at my level of my career, I mean, you'll never stop learning. You'll never, ever, ever stop learning. Okay. Um, you don't want to. If anyone right. ever says, I know everything, they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but at the end, uh, I would say I've, I've hit a lot of stuff uh, in my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff in my career. Um, you know, I also run through a lot of different, uh, ob- uh obstacles in my career, mm-hmm. but at the same time, uh, there's always a solution somehow, some way. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, yes, there are some things in my career that I haven't seen, especially over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the tax law changes every year. And, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, and now with there's the, the Trump tax cuts that got put in, uh, back in 2018, or I'm sorry, in, in, yeah, 2017, 2018, um, that are going to be sunsetting here at the end of 2024, 2025. So mm. there are some things, there's some changes that are coming down the pipe that a lot of people don't realize that are coming mm. down. But needless to say, um, there are things that I haven't seen that I have to go do research on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the biggest things with, with our career, with what I do license-wise, I have to make sure that um, I can and will um, be able to say that I don't know everything. Yeah. Because if someone ever says that, they're lying. So go ahead. No, I was going to say, so the, you were talking about how these new tax laws are coming into effect. Do, I, mean, I mean, we've been going to you for a while, mm-hmm. so I, I'm, I'm unaware, but like H&R Block or TurboTax, right? Are they... Uh, do you think they inform the consumer as well? For, like, do, do you understand? I I don't think that they would. And granted, I can't speak on on all of these folks, mm. but I will say um, that based on my experience, those industry that group of uh, people aren't the best of informers of people that are trying to go with, with them. Based on my experience, mm-hmm. mind you, I get a lot of those folks that do come over from H and R and or Turbo, um, you know, that say, "Well, you know, my person didn't tell me that." Mm, um, yep. Unfortunately, um, and I hate to say it this way, but H and R and your Jackson Hewitts and stuff like that, they get a lot of um, 
individuals that only get about four to six weeks worth of training. And wow. um, yeah, that, and then they put them out there to start working. So Ooh. they don't really know the laws and the rules as well. But I do know some that have been there 10 years. Mm -hmm. And again, but they don't get in as as well and enveloped and in, in, in enthralled with the rules and regs as we do. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the software does a lot of what Turbo looks for. So the software is going to make the changes. So, yeah. But the problem that you run into is it's supposed to be intuitive based on what you put into the questions. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing questions and you answer a question incorrectly because you th interpret it one way versus this is what they're mm. what they're wanting it's going to veer you off in a path that it's going to mess you up I reviewed one um just recently it was probably about six weeks ago that uh the lady unfortunately uh there was one deduction that she had in, in the return three separate times and it was pretty su significant it was like i think ten thousand a piece Jeez. three separate times so it calculated it three times in her return to reduce her thing by three times, which it shouldn't have. Oh. And so unfortunately, she, I had to go back, and we're going to have to go back and amend that. And it's going to cost her a pretty penny. She got a pretty si hefty refund. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, you know, because the way she does, as and I hate to say it this way, but she, she relied on the software to do, to, to, to do the job as what a professional should do. Yeah. So, I mean, just it's, would you say like accounting and, and the tax advisors, right? It's a very personal uh, relationship. It's based off of not just like, oh, yep, got it, got it, got it. Thanks. Good. Great. No, I, what I really like about you is that you really take the time to sit down with us, get to know not just um, the numbers in our business, but get to know us or like, hey, well, what do you, what, what's, what's your goals? The plan? What's the plan? Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about this year. Let's talk about the next few years mm -hmm. so we can adjust. And you take the time to answer our questions. Mm -hmm. So I have another question, of course, with AI coming into play. Um, I feel like a lot of people will ask like ChatGPT, mm -hmm. right? How to do your taxes or strategies or planning? How do I do this, do that? Do you find that people are bringing that up in conversations within, within your industry? I've had, I've had a couple of people already try to, you know, tell me that, you know, we're expect that they're going to be expecting that coming through, coming from ChatGPT. Hmm. But again, and it's, it's all based on intuition of knowing the individual. Hmm. And, you know, I mean, 20 years worth of experience behind my belt, l knowing what you and Gabe want, trying to figure out what you guys need for the future for what your plans and goals are. So and, and, and understanding the situation at the end of the at the end of the day is going to be the most important piece, in my opinion, uh, to figuring who you guys are, to yeah. figuring out what y'all need, because I'm going to make the, make sure that those conversations are had mm -hmm. before um, because. You know, we we don't know what the future is going to hold mm -hmm. on a on a and a, on a year by year level. Mm -hmm. uh, all we can do is plan for this is what we're going towards and make sure that we try and get there. So yeah, and I think another thing to keep in mind is people a lot of the times they think oh, I'll just write everything off, and then we have some clients that will come to us the next year and they're like I'm ready to buy a house, I've been saving up, I'm ready to go, and then of course they have to turn the tax returns to the lender, and it shows. Shows that you didn't make that much money last year. So I think it really helps um, to for, for people to know mm -hmm. that you need to plan ahead and you need to talk to somebody who's uh, educated. Right. And not only just educated about the, the whole system and all those numbers, but educated on how to talk to people or educated on their, their clientele. Because I know a lot of my clients well enough to say, okay, prime example, I've got, I also work with a lot of lenders too. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of these lenders that I know that I work with, they're like, they're like, okay, we'll call it Jane Doe is going, is want to, want to buy a house in 18 months. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do, have we filed the, this year's taxes yet? No, we're on extension. Okay. We got to make sure that we probably, we, we work with this, with Jane Doe to get her enough income to show properly on her return yeah. to make sure she qualifies for this year, this year's return and next year's return to properly show that she has enough in income. Yes. So that's that is a huge benefit to working with a professional that understands the situation, understands what people are looking for, and most importantly, understands what the client needs. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, everyone's goal is to make sure they write off every single thing that they can do. <laughs> mm. 
this is true, but there's a way to write things off. Um, mm. Specifically, um, depreciation. Depreciation is one of those big, huge key factors that a lot of clients uh, don't truly understand versus what lenders are looking for. When you depreciate an item, it's an add back for income for, for when you're trying to qualify for a home. Mm. And a lot, of, a lot of clients don't know that. So when, they're tell, when they want to tell me, oh, well, I'm just going to write, you know, $15,000 worth of equipment off. Okay, let's take a look at that equipment. What is it? Hmm. And they tell me, well, it's a it's a $5,000, you know, I don't know, laser printer and, you know, $1,500 worth of um, worth of printer and other things. And I'm like, okay, we can still write it off. But what we're going to do is we're going to move it from equipment, uh, I'm sorry, from supplies and tools and materials as a line, line, item, line item expense on the return. Hmm. And moving it over to a depreciable line item still shows the same effect. You still get the bottom line. You don't pay as much taxes. But I know that it needs to be on this line hmm. on the return because it's going to be an add back for income tax or for, for qualification purposes. Yeah. Just saying. I just got excited <laughs> when he's talking about it. I'm like, because there's, I mean, to the average consumer, like to Gabriel and I, or to average family, I think taxes sometimes can feel like such a stressful experience. So I think that's why a lot of people kind of have it, well, I the easy way out, right? Mm-hmm. I'll just do TurboTax or just go here just, just to get it done with because it's such an, a big thing to handle or to think about. They're like, just, I don't want to stress about it. So they're like, just, you know. But at the same time, if, if your goal is to do something for the future that's going to best set you mm-hmm. up for, for qualifying for a house or for, you know, making, owning a business. Owning, I mean, it's, that's and, a, that's a prime example. A lot of people, and granted, TurboTax. I'm not saying that TurboTax doesn't serve a purpose. Mm-hmm. I really do think that it does serve a purpose because eighty percent of the people that do, I'd say probably seventy percent of the people that use TurboTax, it works for what they're looking for, which is a person that has a W two, a house, and a couple of kids on on you know. Uh, that you know maybe husband and wife double two house and and a couple of kids it works mm-hmm. but for someone that has multiple businesses maybe a rental property or a couple of rental properties mm-hmm. um you know those are those are things that you know a business or a few business those are things that i'm like all right dude seriously we need to take a step back don't use turbo don't even go to and i hate to say it don't go to uh to the h and r's because they don't know they're going to just try and give you everything that they can to mm-hmm. make your refund be as max as it possibly can be even though may, they may even screw it up and put it in the wrong place mm. i've seen that a lot so just just saying i mean grant everything serves its purpose mm-hmm. every every professional has a has a role in this world mm-hmm. um whether it be selling houses whether it be um preparing tax terms and that's another thing too and this is a huge big thing for me that scares me there's a lot of quote-unquote professionals that are doing tax returns that won't even and if you want to have someone that has a red flag out there that won't sign the bottom line on the second page of the return they'll put it as self-prepared because they're going to do it through TurboTax Mm -hmm. unfortunately that is a very 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 big problem that we have in this in this world I wasn't even aware Mm -hmm. of that They, they they do it they'll go by the software right Mm-hmm. They'll go buy the software for you. They'll bill you for it. They'll buy the software. They'll they'll input everything into the return, but it says self prepared at the bottom. When and then when someone says, "Well, I paid my CPA to do it," I look at the second page. Did you now? <gasps> That's sleazy. Oh, it happens all the time. That's a big. I thing. didn't even know that. That's a huge deal. Ugh. And unfortunately. And then when you try to, if the if let's say that the person uh, screws up the return and you get audited, that person's off the hook because <gasps> that the, right. the individual signed it as self prepared. Oh my gosh! Mm-hmm. And then that's kind of when they actually look for an actual accountant to fix the problem. To fix the problem. Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh, that's jarring. I didn't even know that. I would say. Out of the mistakes that I had to clean up, that's probably about 40% of them. Wow. So what is the biggest piece of advice you could give to that average 
family, whether no matter where they go or what they do, if they want to, even if they don't have a plan for a business or uh, a rental property or investments or anything like that, what's the best advice you have for them to optimize like on their tax strategy or planning or because I mean, of course, those families still want to plan vacations or something, you know, they they have goals in mind. What's the best advice you would give them? The best advice I would give them is figuring out what they want to do. Mm. Do they do they truly live paycheck to paycheck or mm. do they, you know, they've got multiple kids that are going getting ready to go to college, maybe they got 529s involved. Um, maybe they they want to start saving for their own retirement, so they've got 401k's, you know, SEP IRAs, regular IRAs, you know, um, you know, Roth versus traditional. You hear all these different words and different things and people freak out when they hear that stuff because a lot of them they don't know what it truly means i would say at least have a conversation with a professional mm-hmm. um and i would think that having a conversation for, for example having a 30 minute consult for oh, with me is free mm. having and figuring out what you want to do yeah. is free for that that quick 30 minute conversation It'll probably save a lot of time and headaches for for the future. Because at least it's like, hey, if you don't use me, at least you're now guided in a better direction than just Correct. kind of looking it up online and you're unsure as to, you know, is this the right thing? Or because another website that said this and it's a little bit different. So, you know. I, I, I think the biggest thing that I would see is just having, you know, let, let's talk, let, theoretically, investments. When we deal with people that have investments, some people, they want to do investments from the perspective of, um, you know, I'm going to go on to, uh, I don't know, let's call it ter- uh, TD Ameritrade, and I'm going to trade stocks here and there, and I'm going to make, try and do day trading versus, you know, is that a good idea versus someone that is going to buy and hold strategy? Those are, those are more, t- those types of questions from, from a financial advisor perspective i can't legally advise on that Mm -hmm. but i can tell you based on my experience is you got to be careful what you're doing because if you do go from a taxation perspective if you do day trading i've had this one (laughs) had this one guy come in and he made he, he, he bought and sold a ton of stuff day trading it was over four and a half million dollars worth of worth of income on paper Okay. But he day traded the same, you know, he had about a hundred thousand, maybe less than a little less, maybe around 50 K. He day traded this stuff every single day. Wow. He'd buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, buy every day. All those transactions totaled out to be over $4 million worth of income that wasn't taxable, Hmm. but it was income. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when he prepared his tax return, he did not include the cost of that Mm. income so he had a four hundred thousand dollar tax bill at the end of the year and he was freaking out (laughs) and he said what did i do wrong oh boom there you go that's it yeah all you did you didn't add this piece to the return oh you just saved me a headache because i didn't make any money i said i know you didn't it shows that you didn't but Mm -hmm. you didn't show the irs that you didn't because when he Mm -hmm. submitted his stuff through TurboTax, Uh. when he submitted it he forgot that piece altogether because it didn't make any money. So he thought, I didn't make any money, so mm. I don't have to report it. The IRS got the $4.5 million worth of income. That's all they got. Yeah. And so we had to go back and tell the IRS, oh, by the way, here's the expenses that mm. you that you didn't add, the cost. He's oh. like, ah, oh, that's huh. true. So I'm about to get into, I do want to talk about, the you, you mentioned stocks. So I mm-hmm. want to get that to that next. But first, kind of that, what you were just describing what is the most common mistake that you see people making when they do the taxes themselves? And how can they avoid that? And maybe if it's, of course, like, go to a professional, call me. <laughs> I will always say go to a professional, yeah. call me. Okay, but what is the most common or and the biggest mistake you've seen in your career and the most common mistake you see? Both of those. I would say the biggest mistake that I've seen in my career would have to be something to that degree of like the stock stuff. Mm. I mean, it was a big bill. I mean, it's 400 plus thousand dollars that this person ended up owing. It was a lot of money. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, he didn't know it. 
mm-hmm. because he forgot this one line on the return. Yeah. And, but but again, he did he, because he said that he didn't make any money. He thought that he didn't have to put that in the return. Mm-hmm. A lot of people they don't they don't think that they should have to put that in. I agree, but they have to report the ins and the outs, and that's the piece that you're missing. So, a really common mistake that I see and deals with real estate. Um, two parts actually. Uh, rental properties. Mm. A lot of people forget depreciation on rental properties mm. because they just, oh, well, TurboTax didn't ask me. I know they didn't. <laughs> so um, one of the biggest ones that I see, that I like to see, is um, when you're able to show that depreciation that was missed, and then when you add it on this year's return for them and show them, oh, by the way, I'm able to add an additional six, eight, ten thousand dollars worth of depreciation expense on the books. Mm. They're like, oh my God, I owe less for this year. Can you fix last year? Oh yeah, I can just add that amended part in the return. Done. And mm. it basically save them another, you know, fifteen hundred, twenty five hundred, thirty five hundred dollars worth of tax. Yeah. It's beautiful. But that's one piece. Uh-huh. The other piece that I can tell you, and I very, very, very common. People buy their per you know, sell their personal residence. Mm-hmm when they sell their personal residence, especially if it's over $250,000, mm-hmm. the IRS is required, the, the, the title company is required to send out what they call a 1099-S. And it's, it's basically a sale. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it's her personal residence, still got to send it out. The IRS is going to get that document. And if you don't report that on the tax return and show that on the tax return, the IRS is going to freak out mm. and they're going to want, you know, money because they say, oh, you didn't add this. You owe, owe us some money. One of the, the biggest, most common mistakes is forgetting that little piece and then adding that the sale and the cost basis on the return. Mm. And you know this being in real estate, but a lot of people don't know the real rule, what they call the Section 121 exclusion. Mm-hmm. Section one, Section 121 ex- exclusion is the two out of the last five year rule. And I know you know what that is. Mm-hmm. But the way that it works is um, if you don't show it on the return, the IRS doesn't know it, doesn't know it exists. Yeah. So if they don't see, if they don't see the, the, the 1099 or the, the income being shown on the, on the return, they'll never know to ex- exclude it either with using the 121 exclusion. Mm-hmm. So. Interesting. Do you have social media? Uh, we do have a presence. Um, not as... I'll be real honest. We um, because we have made a transition uh, mm-hmm. within uh, with our company uh, this year. The previous owner uh, that owned it prior to me, I bought it from her back in 2019. Mm. We kept her name on the door for a handful of years, and now that she's fully retired, um, uh, she has. I have changed the name back in January. Mm-hmm. Um, it used to be Backley and Rodriguez Companies. Miss Backlita has now since retired, and so now it was going to be just Rodriguez companies. I'm like, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> so it's not personalized. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so we decided to change the name to Presidio Advisory Group. It's more of an homage to uh, my hometown, which has the Presidio La Bahia, which was the is the only re- restored Mex- Spanish uh, fort west of the Mississippi, mm-hmm. um, and um, it's fully restored Spanish uh, Spanish fort uh, west of the Mississippi. And it is, a, you know, that's because it's beautiful, but also because that's where I got married. My wife my wife and I got married. My, um, my parents got married. My grandparents got married. We've had 300 years. We've had 300 years worth of family that got married at that church. Mm. So it brings a little bit of a uh, homage to, my, to that for that. Yeah. For, so, but again... That's why we changed the name. So to answer your question, yes, we do have social media, but it's being revamped, I guess is the word. Might I make a suggestion? Yes, ma'am. You should create your own hashtag and make it like well known and you should be hashtag tax wizard. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> I, I, initially at one point I, I, I had one going, I think it was a couple of years ago prior to the, the, the previous election. I think it said, uh, what did it say? tax uh your your hometown tax friendly accountant so i'm like i forgot what it was mm. but i like i like the tax tax wizard, wizard. This, hashtag that, that, tax like wizard that. i'm about to use let's that get one. that going <laughs> <laughs> hashtag tax wizard gabriel and i will start it when we start there, posting both these there videos you go. 
there you go. So going back to the socks, like I said, mm -hmm. I remember our last meeting, in-person meeting that we had with you, kind of going over our own tax returns and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You mentioned something about stock. So you want to start helping people with stock. So you're wanting to kind of diversify your what you help people with. Is that still a thing? That still is a thing. Okay. I am working on getting my Series 65 um, license. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to become a, uh, in, in addition to my, my tax side, I want to become a financial advisor. Uh, mm -hmm. The financial advisor side is more, um, not necessarily the CFA part of it, but I mean, there is, uh, basically what it is, is just basically you have the ability to become a registered uh, a registered uh, financial advisor uh, at that point. Mm -hmm. an R, I think it's called um, an RIA is what the actual term is. So, um, and I think that that is is still a goal. Okay, it's still something that I'm working on. It's going to take a little little time. My mentor that it is helping, his name is Doug. Really nice guy, mm -hmm. uh, and but you know he understands that because I'm really busy and running my own <laughs> practice. Uh, he also knows that it, it is, it takes time, yeah. it takes effort. And there's some tests that I do have to pass and take and pass and do all that stuff mm -hmm. to continue. So the usual stuff mm -hmm. for sure. So, um, I want to get into the accounting in a minute. Like I have some questions there and I don't want to forget them, but I mean, since we're talking about the big scary man of taxes, right? What are some dangers and about self-filing or audits or What's a horror story that you've heard? Maybe not one you've been connected with, but like talk about those those dangers or um, where people find themselves in really bad situations because they filed wrong or an audit came in and, and all that stuff. Well, one of the biggest things that I would say is um, there is always a solution. Um, but to answer the ultimate question is, you know, talk about the dangers. The IRS is it was built for a reason. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it's supposed to monitor us. It's supposed to keep an eye from the perspective of the monies that are coming in and the out, the inflows that are coming into the government and the outflows that need to go back out to you guys, us as, as taxpayers, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we the government runs on the amount of money that it's supposed to run on. Unfortunately, that number has been growing and growing, you know, for many, many moons now, but we're not going to get in a political rant on, uh, at this point. So, um, <laughs> but you know, bottom line is, um, the, the, the IRS is a big, big, bad boogeyman, but they are also very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll be very honest with you. A lot of people freak out when they start talking about the, the IRS. Um, but most importantly, I will say is that I have seen, you know, in my career, I probably have talked to two, maybe three agents um, in my entire career that have been total jerks. Mm. Um, but, I mean, I've talked to hundreds that have been very helpful, very, very insightful. Um, unfortunately, I will say, uh, over the last five years, the, 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 the talent pool has been drained significantly because a lot of the older ones have retired or they've pushed them into retirement. Uh, what I think ended up happening is that they had the same amount of they had the same amount of dollars to, to use, but they needed more talent. So what they did is they pushed a lot of the older ones out. Hmm. They brought in a lot of newer talent, mm -hmm. basically doubling the capacity, but unfortunately lessening the 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 the, the talent pool as far as the amount of uh, brains that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, there are, still are a, a really good amount of folks that are out there, but at the end of the day. To answer the ultimate question is horror stories. I've seen a few. Um, I have one case that I'm working on right now, and particularly um, that the um, the individual. Uh, it's a company. They owe pretty penny, pretty penny, probably four hundred, almost five hundred thousand hmm. um, dollars. They have a business. They made a lot of money. They just didn't pay them the, the amount of money in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but here's the bottom line is there's always a there's always a solution. And the solution is how can we make that number be where it needs to be? Uh, and is it is it an accurate number first? Mm -hmm. And secondarily, if it, they do owe it, then trying to put together a plan of action to make sure that they can mitigate any potential uh, 
you know, potential pitfalls that are out there. Um, if you don't pay your taxes, the IRS can put a lien on you. Um, they can uh, they can force you to basically um, take in and pay. Uh, they can garnish your wages. Uh, they can take away some of your your benefits if you're on Social Security. Mm-hmm. They can take it out of your Social Security to pay it back. Um, seen, I've seen all of that stuff. But most importantly, I mean, if, if you work with them and try and get them what they are get, what they what's what belongs to them, mm-hmm. then it can be done. It can they can be worked out. So try not to avoid it. Just Correct. Just by the bullet. Well, talk to a professional. Literally, mm-hmm. I mean, all joking aside, talk to a professional and figure out exactly how to fix it. Yeah. So. And now you were talking about that the. Before we kind of started the podcast, you were mentioning that a lot of accountants are retired out or mm-hmm. they not. Of course, that that makes sense. You know, you reach a certain age and you're like, I've been doing this for right. 40 years. I'm ready to go. But right. you have a lot of I guess like the real estate industry, right? Like a majority of their agents, like 85, 90 percent don't make it past the first two years. Right. So I I mean, real estate's fun. It is. <laughs> I. No accounting is fun for you, but I know it's a way more stressful job and it has a lot of hours put behind it. Right. Like you just said, during tax season, you work at least 80, 90, 100 hours a week. Mm-hmm. So I can see why a lot of um, accountants don't stay in the job. So how is that affecting your business today and other other accountants that you talk to? Um, in Especially in the local area, in the San Antonio area, I can tell you, I mean... This this fact uh, from the nation from you know national statistics, uh, there was three hundred eighty plus thousand people last year alone mm-hmm. that retired from the accounting industry. That was over um, over ten percent of mm-hmm. our entire workforce from the accounting uh, the accounting and tax world have yeah. all just basically left. A lot of them were retirees um, that were got to that point. They were ready, ready baby boomers, ready to get out. Yeah. Um, a lot of them, uh, uh, there were a bunch of younger folks too, mm. um, that that don't want to put in the amount of hours. And I hate to say it that way, but they they just they, they're not. I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer, and mm-hmm. so uh, my Gen X background is we just we 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 stick it out. We do what we got to do in order to do it. Yeah. Um. Unfortunately, and I don't like saying it this way, but the generation behind us, um, is there are other things that they want to do and they don't want to put in the, as much time and effort and work mm-hmm. that we do. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that about all of them, not yeah. at all, but I'm um, not trying to single out a generation. You're just either. seeing a trend. I, I, I'm seeing a trend. Absolutely. Um, and I'm also noticing that um, a lot of accountants that are in school, unfortunately, um, don't, they're not going into this, into the tax world. They're going into, I'm going to go work for pri- private equity or mm-hmm. VC work, or I'm going to go work for an, in, uh, a, a, an investment firm. Um, you know, I'm going to go work for, I don't know, financial advisor side, you know, mm-hmm. just to stay away from the tax world because they know that this world is hard to do and they don't want to take the effort and the time to do it, unfortunately. So, um, yes, has it affected our industry? Absolutely. I mean, we, I mean... There are fewer and fewer of us and more and more of the taxpayer, more and more people that are doing one or two or three gig economy type jobs Mm. just to make ends meet or because they they find it fun. I mean, um, it's very easy to to, to make that destination. So it can be there. It is there. So would you could you say maybe a positive twist on it too could be well it's it's more work for y'all and at least it kind of weeds the, the the bad ones out does that make sense to, the- a, to a point okay to a point but unfortunately um and, and I'm seeing it every day I mean we're we're super busy all the time mm. and we don't have enough staff to mm. for I mean I have nine people that work for me that work with me and for me mm-hmm. and um, you know unfortunately, um, you know, we, when we run through that, that side, it's just, it's, it's hard. And so that's why I put I in the hour of the, the number of hours that I do, because I know the work still has got to get out and yeah. you guys as, as cl- clients <laughs> want the stuff done. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yes, it, it, yes, it can be a blessing, but it also can be a curse as well. Yeah. So. Double two edges, two sides mm-hmm. of the sword. For sure. So with you working 
20 years in the business and working diligently and really hard at what you do and honing in on your craft, that's got to take a toll on stress or your personal life and marriage. How do you achieve that balance? And I'm sure it's taken trials and tribulations for, on the personal side as well. It does. It does. I mean, um, I have been blessed enough to, with, the, with you know, my wife, uh, I love her to death. Um, she is, she's my, she's the rock and soul of our, of our family. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, I, the heart and soul, I can definitely say, you know, I, when I have a bad day, she picks me up when I'm having a great day. She knows how to, um, she knows how to keep that, that great make, make day. Make it last. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, I, I mean, I couldn't do this without her. Mm-hmm. I will tell you, and it literally and figuratively, um, uh, prior to me buying the business from the previous owner, uh, she, I remember, you know, we, we seriously discussed it of me opening up my own shop and we discussed it hard. And she said, if this is your passion, this is what you need to do. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm a hundred percent behind you. Yeah. So, I mean, we, when we, we, we talked about it before and when we made that conscientious effort to do it, we did it. But I will say, I mean, it's not been easy. I mean, being a mm-hmm. business owner, you guys know it. It's, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. Over the la- when when I bought the company, um, she came on board with me, and mm. so she, her and I worked together. Uh, she is with me. She's she's a pediatric physical therapist by trade. Um, she's done it for a long time. She's still been she still does it today, mm. but she's down to, to to two days a week now versus and working three with me three plus days. I mean, she works forty plus hours a week anyway. Nice balance. And so, but at the same time. Uh, she works 40 plus hours with me and still does her 15 to 20 hours a week with uh, her other yeah. company. So she still works a lot too. Yeah, so, very cool. But ultimately, the work-life balance of it, I mean, we, we, we try to do as much as we can during the normal business hours. Mm-hmm. Once we get home... We no, shut it don't, off. Don't talk about work. We, we, we try not to talk about work. We try can to always shut it handle it tomorrow Correct. the next day. Correct. Um, and, you know, outside of tax season, I mean, we do, we do try, like right now, um, I'm still, we're still catching up. I, I, I back off. I, I come home, try, I try to be home, leave the office by six. That's my goal. Mm-hmm. By six every day. And on Fridays, regardless if it's during taxes or not, I try to leave the house by five. Mm. Because it Friday nights are our, my family, we, we sit we sit and we watch stupid movies and and mm-hmm. you know we we have our friday night dinner that's mm-hmm. our thing and then uh we will watch a disney movie we'll watch of course when my little one was young we'll watch disney princess yeah. movies and all that other stuff but it <laughs> yeah. was it was fun um and now we're watching you know we're we're bringing my daughter into the world of the old stupid slapstick, you know, eighties comic uh, or dumb movies. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, "Dad, this is dumb." I said, "No, but, but your mom and I are laughing our butts off." Yeah, she, <laughs> and she's exactly. like, and she's like, "But this is." I said, Shh. "You know what movie you should do if you haven't done it yet? Rat Race." We I haven't showed seen that our, one. we oh we showed our son our oldest and yeah. he was dying. It was such it was nice. it's such a good time when you like you have to watch this classic. So for sure. Um, now. Tell us, because we don't want to be all negative, right? right. Tell us a, a really happy story or like a rewarding client experience that you've had. You're like, oh, this is this is this is great. This is why I do what I do. Some of the best ones. I mean, uh, it happens every year um, yeah. when you're working with someone that pr- brand new, out of the box, gig economy, or you know, just went off on their own for the first time. And, you know, when you're able to help save them money on their taxes, hmm. significant amounts of money yeah. on their taxes and being able to show that, hey, they're they're making, you know, they're you're doing it hmm. and or seeing them from infancy hmm. of their business to where they are today. Yeah. I have one particular client. I mean, it's so rewarding. I mean, just being able to see the growth. This guy, this guy started with his business with uh you know i think a thousand dollars and now he is i would say on an average on an average year he'll bring in a million and a quarter a year nice and so i mean he's that's that's the kind and that for me that's rewarding because i see 
I like to see people grow. Mm-hmm. I like to see people, um, I will say rewarding. There's more success stories than not. Yeah. And that's, that to me is the cool part about what mm-hmm. I do. Um, you know, and I, I love it. Mm-hmm. I, I love seeing people succeed. I love, there's an old saying, you know, my dad used to tell me there's an old saying in Spanish where, uh, you know, you, you would, there's a, there's a, a barrel of crabs, uh, and in the barrel, uh, you got the crabs that you open the barrel and, and people, the crabs are trying to get out and the other ones are pulling them pulling back them in. Down. For me, it's the other way around. I like to see the crabs pushing the other ones out. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, is one of the best things that I could say that I love to see is, uh, is we have more success stories than not. Yeah. And, you know, people say, well, success stories are a dime a dozen. Or, I'm sorry, that are ri- that are rare. No, they're not. If you want them, if you, if you look at everyone's success stories being different, mm. if you're trying to compare it to yourself, it's hard. Yeah. But everyone's success story is different Mm -hmm. you know getting past year one is is a success getting past year Year two two. (laughs) is a success yeah i mean i've been doing this on my own officially since 2014 Mm -hmm. so um you know it's it's been a couple of years Mm. i mean 10 years officially on my own uh 20 years in the business altogether so it's 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 hard Mm -hmm. but um you know when i bought the company from my the previous owner I did, little did I know that six months later it was going to be COVID. Mm. So yeah, there was there was about a little there was I would say about a, a two week period where I didn't know if I was going to shut the doors or not. Wow! It was in I remember it was very it was some September of 2020, and I just remember you know that first week and I'm like my wife and I were looking at the numbers and looking at the the money that was in looking at our payroll. We're like, what the hell we're we gonna do? Mm. And she said, you know, let's let's cut people. So we had a mass layoff. We we had at the time we had thirteen people. Mm. I think we we went down to six mm. at that point, six or seven, seven. Yeah. And um, you know, it was a, it was it was hard. A difficult choice. I mean, it was hard to do because I love these people. Mm. These, these people are my people. Yeah. Um, I I I I have a hard time with that, but. Again, my wife was able to really kind of guide me through it. So, yeah. Well, I love it. Well, we're almost getting out of time. So, uh, what advice do you have for aspiring future accountants? What advice would you have for them to prepare them for this and to have help have them stick through it? First piece of advice that I would say is. Nothing is harder than, than, than doing it on your own. Mm. Um, start off, I would guarantee, work for a small company. Work for a mom and pop. Work for somebody that you've got exposure to many different things. Mm. Because you don't, and I hate to say it this way, yeah, you can go work for your, your big four, um, your E&Y, your, uh, you know, your Price Waterhouse Coopers, so on and so forth. And they can pay you a ton of money. Mm-hmm. But they're gonna treat you like a cog in the wheel, and if you and if you can't keep up, they'll kick you out. Mm. Unfortunately, they're gonna work you to death. But if you work for mom and pop place, they're gonna try and take watch your back. They're gonna take care of you. Mm-hmm. They're gonna do a lot of things that. Um, I mean, I hate to say it, but they're gonna expose you to a lot of, a lot of good things that are gonna help you for your career for the future. Yeah. So. That would be thing number one uh, that I would say for a lot of the future accounts who want to go out there. Work for a small mom and pop place that, and give it a shot. Don't don't get frustrated. Don't get don't discouraged. Don't discredit it. Yeah. Yeah. D- don't I mean, dog it till you try it. And 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 a lot and, and I hate to say it, but a lot of folks get really upset with, um, well, you know, so and so is making X number of amount per year. You know, working for you know one of the big four. Yeah, but so and so is going to be out in two years when, and she's going to go work for a bank in two years because she can't hack working in the tax industry. Mm, sure, so she'll get burnt out too. She'll get burnt exactly. So I said, prime example: work for somebody who's small that gives that opportunity to 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 do it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and get that experience too. Exactly for people who have a little bit more patience. <laughs> sure. During COVID, it was really hard because a lot of people were 
you know, closing shop. It was difficult. So um, much uncertainty. Yeah, extremely. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of government programs that were out there. I took advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was able to, 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 because I had payroll, I was able to take what they call the PPP program and, yep. and, and, and help me survive. Mm -hmm. um, now, that program that doesn't exist anymore, but there are government, uh, there are other state and local programs that are out there. You just have to try and find them. Look, being local here in San Antonio, there are a lot of things, you know, through Bear County, through um, through the city of San Antonio, uh, that are out there. That if you're looking for um, grants to help start your business, to help keep your business afloat, there are things out there. Mm. Uh, I don't have anything in particular or specific. But I know there are programs out there. So. Yeah. And it helps talking to a professional because absolutely Turbo Tax ain't gonna do that for you. Be this like, is true. Hey, <laughs> you know. So it really helps to just be a solution oriented professional, no matter what industry you're Correct. in. But especially for for a small business. Small businesses or just anything with tax. And absolutely. it's just there's so many unknowns out there and uncertainties that if they go to a professional like yourself, um, it could really just be like a light switch, be absolutely Correct. beneficial. Correct. My husband wants to ask a question. Um, advice for people who want to, do you have advice for people who want to invest in, in real estate? Um, main piece of advice that I would say is um, don't be afraid to take a risk. Hmm. There are, there's always going to be risk yeah. involved with anything that you do. But at this, but at the end risk, the risk reward factor on real estate especially here in San Antonio mm -hmm. is a lot higher than in other locations. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm, absolutely. I would say you, grant because we're so stable mm -hmm. economy wise here, we're so stable from the perspective of um, the real estate side. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our, our rates are, our, our real estate rates haven't moved up and down like in, uh, in Chicago or in, you know, New York or in your other location, California, yeah. I mean, Las Vegas. I mean, those, those, those markets go ups and down mm -hmm. like crazy here. We're, we're, we've got little peaks and valleys, but mm -hmm. nothing to like to the degree that they do. So, yeah. um, you know, I would say talk to professionals such as yourselves to try and figure out exactly, you know, if you're, if someone wants to put some money into a, into buying a piece of property or buying a house or buying a multifamily or duplex, quadplex, mm -hmm. uh, eightplex. I, I will say the one thing I will say cap rates, got to look at your cap rates on mm -hmm. all your, on, on all your pieces, um, that you're looking for. Cost segregation analysis is another thing that you want to look at when it mm -hmm. comes to um, uh, real estate investing, especially if it's multifamily. Um, you know, mul the multiple doors that your cost seg is going to help you tremendously. And, um, you know, having the ability to have those conversations of talking to the professional if, from the perspective of, you know, I want to buy this, you know, how much money do you can get for it? How much do I need to put in? You know, what do I need to get in order to do it? So. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I have a surprise for you. Oh. I do this with every at the end with every guest. But before I give you the surprise, you got to do one thing for me. Okay. You have to ask a come up with a question for me to ask the next podcaster. Okay. And then I'll tell you the question that we had from the last podcaster. All right. And, you know, honestly, he knew that you were an accountant, so he asked a tax-based question. But you don't know the next guest, so you have to ask. Just, well, what does the next person do? I can't tell you that. That's I, not nice. Have... <laughs> All right. Honestly, we're still tr uh, planning it, so okay. <laughs> we don't really know. <laughs> um, okay. Ask this person. Okay. An embarrassing story. Oh, okay. <laughs> from high school nice and i like it's fun it's a it's a you know fun uh embarrassing story from high school okay that's that's what i will say all right just one just one, just one. <laughs> we all or, uh, uh, well, uh, we? Or, or we can even say college just in case if this person didn't have one in high school okay but all right perfect Great. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that. Now the pot, the question that was asked from the lad pos podcaster we had, he's, um, actually a top agent 
in San Antonio. Okay. And uh, baby you might have to help me with the question a little bit. But he was asking specifically kind of for real estate professionals. Is there something that we can do? Or what do you recommend? If I'm Gabriel, please correct me again, like if I'm wrong. But is there anything that real estate professionals can do um, when opening up their own business? Should they do what? Which route should they go? Because I think some people hear LLC, they hear S Corp, C Corp, they hear all of this jargon. What would you recommend for a real estate agent? Is that the question? Oh, hold on. <laughs> you might remember better What's than me. What's the best form of? What's the best form of a company or entity for a real estate professional? Okay. Um, I Semantics would say, at this point, babe. I said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, um, from a tax perspective, okay. I would say... Let's, it would all, it would all depend on what you anticipate your revenue to be. Mm. Um, it's all revenue generated. Mm. And, you know, if you're, if you're out there making a ton of money. Yeah. When I say a ton of money, I mean, well, let's call it millions and millions of dollars. Okay. Then it might be, and when I say ton of money, I'm talking your net profit, not your gross, your top line. I'm talking your bottom line. Yeah. Then... A C corporation might be the ty- the proper strategic move to what you're looking for for this company, hmm. because a C corporation is taxed at a flat rate, twenty one percent flat, mm-hmm. so it doesn't move. Yeah. So, and then you can take it. You can draw a salary out of that C corp, and 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 whether it be you know, a hundred thousand, five fifty thousand, two million doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You can, you can determine what your salary is as long as it's it's uh, you're paying yourself as an owner. Um, there is the double taxation aspect of it, but we, that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. We can go down that rabbit hole later. Um, I would say the most common structure would be a single member LLC, and then converting and that for the for your state state purposes, uh, li, li, you know, limited liability company state purposes. Uh, and then converting that into an S corporation for 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 uh, for tax purposes, mm. uh, for federal tax purposes, um, that's typically the most common that I see. Okay. Um, and I see that because I say that because um, I know that there are just it, there's a lot of advantages of doing it that way. Um, number number one advantage, most important piece is. Um, you know, you have the ability of having the S corporation, I'm sorry, the, the LLC from a state legal liability protection side of it. Mm-hmm. Granted, I'm not an attorney, so then I can't legally tell you the stuff I'm on that side of it, but I know it does make a big difference from yeah. a legal protection side. Um, S corporation, uh, for, for federal income tax purposes, because once you make that transition, uh, then you're, uh, paying income taxes as a passive entity, which helps your overall income um, and reducing your what they call your self self employment liability aspect of it, mm. so you don't have to pay uh, uh, as much or any self employment tax on that side. Um, so basically, that's usually your best case scenario. Mm-hmm. And then as the the company grows, do you want to do that initially? Probably not. Right off the bat, making the switch over to an S corporation, unless you're making a pretty decent amount of money. When I say decent, you know, let's call it net profit. Let's call it fifteen, fifteen, twenty thousand, hmm. making that transition. Um, and and the reason being is because once you make that transition, then we have to also start looking at okay, what happens if you're not making enough? Because one of the biggest things of becoming an S corporation is having to quote unquote pay yourself a salary. Mm. Yeah. Um, a lot of folks they freak out about that term. Well, what happens if I don't make enough money to pay myself a, a salary as an S corporation? I understand that, and that is that is a key legal point from a taxation perspective, from the IRS perspective, to make that conversation. But you also have to look at it: is there enough income to sustain what they call that that salary? And mm. you know that 
reasonable compensation is the word from the IRS. Yeah. Is it truly enough income to reasonably pay that individual? Mm -hmm. So that's something that we have to look at as well. So from that's the most common piece that I would say that I was that I've seen. Okay. Great advice. Thank you. I'm so excited. So we get to the final end of okay. this. Thank you so much. Thank so you. Um, I love art. I love mm -hmm. doing all things creative. Mm -hmm. So um, as you, I've done some pieces in here. So some stuff we nice, do. Yeah. Um, I Gabriel and I came up with the idea that uh, every podcast podcast guest should get a canvas. So oh. I've done one for you and your family. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, I do it out of crayons, wax art. Oh my goodness! Hold on, I don't want to break anything because I <laughs> I knocked over the picture earlier. Oh wow! So here you go. That is nice. Thank you. Look at this. <laughs> this is cool. Thank you. So wow. Do whatever you'd like with it. This I, is gonna go up in the office. Oh really? Yes, I will take this into oh. the office. So next time I see you, I'm going to be like, where is my painting, Louise? That's right. Where That's is right. it? <laughs> this is really cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very, very much. Perfect. I, I like it. I oh. like it a lot. I am, I'm a huge art person, too. I was, I didn't do band in, in high school and junior high. I was an artist. I, I did mm. art. Uh, and, and. Never got into paint. Uh, I was always a, a, a oh, that's pencil. Not paint. And, that's wax. Oh, that's crayons. Wa wax crayons. <laughs> excuse me. But that is gorgeous. Uh, I mean, it just it's it's beautiful. Oh, actually. thank you. Thank you. Wait, how do you say crayons? Crayons. Crayons. It's crayons. Say that again. Crayons. 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 What the heck is a crayon? That's it's it's crayon. It's it's. <laughs> Gabe, am, am, am I wrong? I mean, it's a crayon, right? It's it's a crayon. Crayon. We're saying the same thing. It's a crayon. In the debates below, how do you say crayon? The proper way do you say crayon? That's <laughs> it doesn't sound right. But crayon doesn't sound anyway. We we could go on this all day. That's that's when we need to get the alcohol. Involved. Yeah, that's not what the podcast is about. <laughs> well, thank you so much thank for you. Louise for being here. We truly appreciate it. Gabriel and I appreciate your business. Thank you. And what you've done for us throughout the years, and as we continue to grow, we are will continue to grow with you. Thank we you. always. Um, so anytime anybody needs a cow in it, we're like, send them your way. Yeah, so I we that. truly appreciate it. For sure. uh, but in the meantime, one more time, kind of tell everybody how they can reach you if they have any questions and uh, talk to the YouTube world. So there you go. Well, um, thank you again, guys. We appreciate it. My, um, again, my name is Luis Rodriguez with Presidio Advisor Group, um, CEO, owner, uh, uh, enrolled agent. Uh, my phone number is 210. 681-8283 um, best email contact is luis.r at band like rock band b-a-n-d r-c-o dot com thank you so much thank you Luis and all of his information is going to be below as well so if you, if you didn't catch that and write it down you can look below I'll have my husband put that and our video editor put it somewhere here too and thank you guys so much for watching this is the home sweet home podcast i'm christina zachary with the zachary team brokered by phyllis brown and company as you guys know gabriel and i are san antonio's realtor couple so if you are looking to buy sell or invest here in san antonio we'd love to help you out and you can reach us at 210-504-5301 and we look forward to seeing you guys in the next one so thank you so much and we will see you later bye bye